the Red Sox five defensive outs away from heading to the World Series. Seven hits at bat thus far for Castillo, trying to get aboard, trying to get the tying run to come to the plate. 3-2 pitch. It's swung on, hit in the air to left. Back is the loop, and Moises makes the catch. Two down. 115 pitches on the night. Brady Little is going to stick with his starter. The Yankees aren't finished yet. Trying to get something going in the bottom of the eighth with one out. Another strikeout for Martinez. And it's figured to make a lot of noise on every out from here on in. Swing and a miss. That's three. We go to the bottom of the eighth inning. One step closer to that promised land. It'll be a 3-2. Swung on and high in the air. Damon is there to make the catch and end the end. The Yankees have three outs left in their season. They're on their feet at Wrigley again. Ninth inning, moment of truth has arrived. And now the 2-1. That's a hot, oh, hot run. Yes. Hot runs are on it waiting. The Chicago Cubs are going to the World Series. Cubs win! Cubs win! Cubs win! It's come down to this, bottom of the ninth inning. Pedro Martinez has been outstanding. Swing and a miss, strike three, the Red Sox win it! For the first time since 1986, the Boston Red Sox are going to the World Series. where they have not been since 1945. Red Sox have stunned the Yankees, shocked New York. And all that's left in this historic stadium is ghostly silence. Can you believe it? Believe it. Believe it. Come on, can you imagine if that would happen? Wow, that would have been a nice way to spend the winter. Do you believe in curses? Well, I never did. Well, neither do I. But I know what happened last year. I, I know, know what, what I, I saw. Can you believe it? Hi, I'm Holly Wartell. Baseball fan, Cubs fan. A forever frustrated Chicago Cubs fan who has never in my life seen them win a World Series. I'm Lenny Clark. Baseball fan, Red Sox fan. That's why I'm standing here in Fenway Park, freezing my butt off. Every year, every year about the time that the ivy on the outfield wall here at Wrigley Field starts to die, so do the Cubbies, who have been around for more than a hundred years. What is up with that? You know, some people say that this is the most beautiful ballpark there is, a shrine to the game. But you know what I think? I think it's a tomb of despair. A place where the gods conspire to rip the hearts out of Red Sox fans who every year say, finally, this is the year! I couldn't sleep the first night we were coming out here spring training. This is my 10th spring training, just to get out here to the field and see the guys. Spring training, a time to reflect, a time to believe. Last year, we were hoping to be good. I and mean, this year, I know we're good. Well, I'm ready. Let's go. But the same fear haunts some teams each spring. A curse. I don't worry about a curse. And that's only for people who are very superstitious. And I'm not superstitious. Ask any died in the world Red Sox fan about the curse, and they'll tell you it's a joke. I mean, we, we all believe in voodoo's. This is nonsense. Do you believe in the curse? I'm uh, starting to. <laughs> yeah. Just sort of the way it happens sometimes makes you wonder. As a fan. Ground ball towards short. Gonzalez has it. Bobbles it. After the error by Gonzalez, it was just too close to not believing it now. I don't believe in curses. If so, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> but the specter of a curse remains in both Boston and Chicago. And it was in the Windy City where they decided to finally do something about it. It's only a fitting that a club that hasn't won a world title in 96 years would have a ceremony like they had tonight. They're going to blow up the baseball. It gives me immense pleasure to reveal to you the ball. Thanks, Harold. Thanks very much. Remember me? This ball represented like the anti-trophy. It was not a good memory. We're only five outs away from going to the World Series. And boom. 
See, now you know me. I'm the Botman Ball. And before I went boom, I enjoyed one last lovely day. Playing the ball, see Wrigley for the last time, you know. And then we're on our way to the hotel for its long night's sleep and its steak and lobster dinner and its massage. Okay, looks like the ball is trickling. Make sure it's a sweet, okay? Enjoy your stay. Thank you. It's dead ball walking today, so it's been his last meal. Your surf and turf meal, courtesy of Harry Carey's. Would you like anything else, Mr. Ball? No, I'm good. Thank you. Enjoy your meal. Oh, I will. Feeling a little tense, though. Get it. You know, this baseball has been through so much trouble. It really deserves this good care. Oh, yeah. A little lower, please. And even though I pleaded for its life, Harry Carey says that it must go. I heard about the Harry Carey's restaurant destruction of the Bartman Ball. And I thought, by golly, you know, we can't go to Chicago for that, but we could do something even cooler here in Alaska. We're here today in Juneau, Alaska, and we're about to fly up onto the Juneau ice field for a ceremonial destruction of a baseball to represent the Bartman Ball. Gentlemen, we are on the Mendenhall Glacier. Let's roll. We're going to go up on the ice field. Danny's going to crack this baseball with an Ernie Banks autographed baseball bat. I've got to be me. Yeah! Woo! Deep into a crevasse where the ball will be crushed by the forces of glacial ice. Goodbye, baseball. That's it. The curse is over, boys. Blowing up a ball, hitting one into a glacier. These Cub fans are desperate. But what are you going to do? Wonder what those bit of Boston fans think about a curse? Do you know anything about curses? I know about the Irish curse. Don't believe in curses. There is no curse. I don't think there is a curse. That's funny, you know, we haven't won the World Series since 1918, and yet, no one in Boston seems to think there's a curse. Why haven't we won the World Series since 1918? I wish I knew. Because we didn't have the right lineup. Now we get Schilling and we get Pedro, and pitching is the name of the game. Well, if the outcome of a season really is determined by players, and not curses, the Cubs and Red Sox have added the talent to prove it. We've added winners. We've added guys who were, were winning fresh in their mind and fresh on their lips. The organization did such a great job with the acquisitions in the offseason. Guys like that are gamers. The players are excited, and so are the fans. This is the year. When I came in, the guys... Yeah, Red Sox all the way. Number one, I guess. Chicago set a major league record by selling more than 572,000 tickets in one day. Tickets, tickets. It was almost like that in Boston, too, when they did Christmas at Fenton. Today was great. They treated us great, gave us hand warmers and coffee. And, and we got a sock. And we got a stocking. Yeah. So both teams beefed up their squad and their fans voiced their approval with record ticket sales. But does any of this matter if there really is a curse? Oh, come on. It's what team you have. It's, you know, these curses are just crazy. People are kind of tired of it. Like, okay, you know, enough is enough. I mean, it's like a joke that you tell 15 times, and you know, the first 10 times it's funny, and after that it's just like, please, you know, get something new. Fans in Boston and Chicago can do their best to dispel any notions of a curse, but their history is inescapable. The last time the Boston Red Sox won the World Series was in 1918. So let me do the math on that for you. If you were a 14-year-old kid watching the Red Sox win it all here at Fenway in 1918, well, that means you're 100 years old this year. At least Boston got to win that World Series in 1918. The last time the Cubs won was 1908. <laughs> Two things have been invented since then that have made it easier for Cub fans to suffer. Television and um, a newer team you might have heard of named the Florida Marlins. Get the picture? Well, it's time for a little history lesson. Curses 101. Let's talk about the curses. I like to talk about that. At the start of this century, Boston and Chicago fans talked a lot about a curse. But at the start of the last century, all they talked about was titles. 
Boston had a proud baseball history that dated back to the early 1870s. They were one of the first dominant teams in baseball as it existed then. The Cubs have a very glorious history. The Cubs were the first dynasty ball club in the 19th century and the first also in the 20th century. The Cubs were the most successful team of all time at that point. They'd have success in 07 and 08. At that time, the Cubs were sort of what the New York Yankees represent today. The Red Sox won five of the first 15 World Series, including three World Series in the teens when Babe Ruth was here. Up until 1918, uh, they're about as good as it gets in the American League. Remember how I told you the last time the Red Sox won a World Series was in 1918? Well, guess who they beat that year? The Cubs. Problem is, the very next year, they sold the best player in the game to, of all people, the Yankees. Ruth is off to New York to the astonishment, I think, of, you know, the baseball community. They can't believe that the Red Sox are going to let this guy go. And, of, of course, that's known as Curse of the Bambino. In our town, so many weird, wild things have happened at the end. You start to look to the larger forces, that's where the Curse of the Bambino comes in. I'm so tired of Red Sox fans always complaining about losing the babe. Please, at least he was a real person. Try going through life thinking that the reason you're a loser is because of a billy goat. The billy goat curse started in 1945, obviously, when they wouldn't let the owner of the billy goat tavern bring his goat into the ballpark for the World Series game. My uncle says, uh, how come you know that I got two tickets, one for me and one for the goat? Uh, says, we don't allow the animals in the ballpark. To me, that's kind of a joke. I mean, uh, even if they did bring the goat into the ballpark, he doesn't bat or feel. Mr. Wrigley says, Bill, you can go in there, but not the goat, because the goat smells it. And later around, the cops lost. And my uncle was sent telegraph to Mr. Wrigley. He says, who smells now? It's one of those tales that will always be retold in Chicago Cub history. First, it once said to me, well, when the Cubs lose, is there a piece of you that, that you lose too? And I said, if that happened every time the Cubs lose, <laughs> there'd be nothing left of me. <laughs> It's true, the Cubs earned a reputation as the lovable losers. However, I do recall a couple of years when victory seemed our destiny. Need proof? Two years, 1969 and 1984. Cubs clearly had the best team in baseball. There's no way if you look at the quality of the two teams that the Cubs could have possibly lost. There were a lot of larger forces at work. After being in first place almost the entire 69 season, the Cubs went into Shea Stadium and encountered still another four-legged omen. And that's that cat made the appearance. Cubs didn't score any more runs against the Mets. That was it for us. It was like a nightmare. I had dreams almost every night about playing in the World Series. Then I would wake up. <laughs> a cold sweat and said, God, it's not happening. Whoa, if Mr. Cub is having nightmares, imagine how the guys on the 84 team felt when they were just one game away from the World Series. We had to win one game out of three, and, and the odds are that, that you're going to do that. We took a three to nothing lead in game five. I had won 14 straight decisions at that point. No reason to believe that we weren't going to continue to head in that direction. Ground ball hit the dirt. Right through his leg! We're tied at three! And the Cubbies never recovered. Cubs are about never getting there. I mean, the last time they were close is like, what, 1908? Boston Red Sox is a different sort of disease. It's the disease of just almost sometimes just getting there. Whether it was Enos Slaughter's mad dash, Yaz winning the Triple Crown but no title, or Fisk unforgettable home run and still no title, the Red Sox have been in four World Series since 1918. And they've lost game seven every stinking time. Cincinnati has won the world championship, beating the Boston Red Sox 4-3. to three. There's nothing lovable about what we've endured in Boston. Need proof? One year, 1986. The sixth game, bottom of the tenth. We're up two runs, two outs, two strikes. How, how can they come back? How can they come back? But the Mets did come back with two outs to tie the game. And that's when fate found Billy Buck. I cheated over to cover more of the hole. And then Mookie dribbles the ball down the first baseline. Couldn't be a worse place for him to hit the ball. Three and two to Mookie Wilson. Little roller up 
up along first. Behind the man. one of those where you just sit there and shake your head and go, well, what happened? When a franchise goes so long without having success, without making the World Series, without winning a World Series, the fans have to come up with some reason uh, why this is. Conveniently, you come up with a curse. You come up with the curse of Babe Ruth, and you come up with the curse of uh, the Billy Goat. It seemed like everyone in the National League was still fighting for a playoff spot deep into September. The Cubs were battling the Astros for the division title. That is, until some Chicago fans grabbed that Billy Goat by the horns to transfer the curse. We said, look, we can't seem to erase this curse. Let's give it to somebody else. We thought it would be a great idea if we tried to bring a goat into Minute Maid Park in Houston. They're not going to let the goat in, and that will do to them what had been done to us. A couple hours before the game, three of our listeners show up. Going in. And they've got the goat. And then they did a chant. Two years shy of 60, sir. For all this time, the Cubs were worse, armed with goat and mystic birth. We hereby reverse the curse. The Astros are doomed. That night, Astros are playing the Giants. They've got Billy Wagner on the mound, who had gone 15 and a third innings without even giving up a run. Back-to-back -back homers on Billy the Kid. Who would have thunk it? They end up losing the game. We now call him not Billy Wagner, but Billy the Goat Wagner. I couldn't believe it. The thing worked. The Astros faded at the end, and the Cubs clinched on the last weekend of the season. The Cubs are the champions of the Central! Goodbye, Houston! Hello, Atlanta! Chicago may have won the division, but Boston won more games. And we cruised into the playoffs as the wild card. And in one hell of a division series, the Red Sox found out that trying to transfer the curse can be risky business. We went down two games before 24 hours even passed, and it was it was like bam. Down two games to none, the series moved back to Boston. This was it. Either win or clean out the lockers. They knew once we brought the series back here at Fenway that uh, our true colors would show. We get back to Boston that night about 3.30 in the morning. I said, boys, I'm shaving my head. Andy Abat gave him a buzz cut. Over 15 players in this roster have done that. The media were looking at us like, you guys are crazy. But these crazy things work. And I said, you watch. He's saying interference, interference call. He gets home plate, one nothing Boston. Some things happened that third game. Birds never touched the plate. The good karma all seemed to be going Boston's way. He's out. He does not score. Amazing. Boy, oh boy, some strange goings on at Fenway Park. Cowboy up, they're chanting at Fenway Park. This is in the air, deep to center. Burns is back at the warning track at the wall. Just another day in the life of some Beantown rustlers. Guys who really know how to cowboy up. Cowboy up! Socks! This is what the Red Sox do. They get themselves maybe into a bind, and then they come storming back. Is it the hair? Is it cowboying up? Or are they just maybe, maybe just good? As the Red Sox have come from behind once again. They fought back so many times this year. We fully expected that the Red Sox were going to win. What a game. What a finish to this series. This ball is gone! Three-run homer, and the Red Sox lead. I did not think that they were going to be able to take three straight, but then again, I never lost hope on them either. This is Lloyd, one-two pitch. Strike three, gone, and the Boston Red Sox have come from behind, winning three in a row. While Boston escaped with their lives, the goatless Cubbies headed south to take on the perennial champions of the National League East, Atlanta. It's the playoffs, and here are the Chicago Cubs. There was at least 15,000 Cub fans at those games. I think it made a big difference down there. Wood is getting more dominating as this game goes on. Game three, Pryor was pitching. He was the first 
playoff game back here, and he pitched lights out that night. Swing and a miss, strike three, and they are rocking Wrigley Field. The Cubs just came in on a roll. They were not going to lose that last game. Gone! And for the first time since 1908, the Chicago Cubs have won a postseason series. It was almost scary. I mean, you just couldn't believe it, that it really felt like the Cubs were going to win the National League. When they beat Atlanta, then I thought, we are finally going to the World Series after all. Pulling it out the way they did, it contributed to that team's mythology, and it made them even more lovable. I think that pretty much put everybody on the side of, OK, they're going to do it this time. When that happened, I thought, no, we're going to be in the World Series, and we're going to win that. Boston, what can I tell you? The food is great, the beer is always cold, the winters are too hot, the summers are way too short, and the falls are far from classic. Well, you could say the same thing about our town. I guess in this tale of two cities, misery really does love company. Cubs are in the water in Chicago. It's there all the time. The Red Sox, even when they're not playing, end up on the front page. And this is a baseball town. It's always going to be a baseball town. Being a Cub fan and a Red Sox fan, why everyone loves them is because they know they're human and that they have failures and things always seem to happen to them at the end. In Chicago and Boston, baseball is part of the fabric of the city. Heck, <laughs> it's almost a religion. Fittingly, both teams play in cathedrals of the game. I think more than any other baseball team, maybe more than any other pro sports franchise, the Cubs are intermixed with their venue. You know, it's not just the Cubs, it's the Cubs and Wrigley Field. Fenway is a civic monument, and it has a resonance and has a place in the hearts of so many people. It's almost unimaginable to anyone on the outside to understand what Fenway means to New England baseball fans. And the personality of a park really is a reflection of the fans that fill it. They care. They care about their team. They, uh, they support us extremely well. They're passionate. And, and they love the game as much as we do. You have some good, good fans. They are loyal to you. They never uh, turn their back on you. They're always there. You know, everybody uh, enjoy to go to where you feel. That young man wearing the Sosa shirt will remember this game. The fan base in Boston is unlike anything else. Go Sox! When there's a game, when it's game day, the streets are a buzz. People walking around in their uniforms. It's like people are going to church. Obviously, they are among the most loyal fans in sports, if not the most loyal fans. It's got to be good for a player to come to Wrigley Field knowing that, you know, you're going to have a lot of people on your side. Listen to these fans! It's an extreme... Uh, amount of passion that's in the city and you love that and you want to play for that and they want to win every game do they take it too hard i don't know because if you're a true fan and when you have your team lose it stinks boston fans so provincial here in chicago we know exactly who we are we understand we get it we know all about fate plagues curses but what is so lovable about losing you always hope for the best um, you don't expect much out of the cubs but every once in a while, they would, they would uh, jump up and surprise you. Like in 84 and 89 and 98, they pretty much came out of nowhere. The Cubs have won it, and they will go to the postseason. But most of the time, you expect very little. The Cubs were kind of predictable. They were the epitome of lovable losers. I think when you're a kid, you're not terribly caught up in whether the team wins a pennant or not. It was only as you got older and the frustration built that it became depressing. I think being a Cub fan is something you have to deal with. I know how they felt in 84 when they blew it because I was there with them. It is a very painful experience at the time to think, well, we could have ended this whole century of losing with this one year. It is absolutely impossible to try and describe the disappointment in this city. If you so much as call a Red Sox fan a lovable loser, you're probably going to get your face rearranged. These fans are angry and bitter and still simmering over names like Bucky and Bucknut and Boom. 
going to Fenway Park and following the Red Sox is a passion play. It is a reenactment of a when of an ordeal that ends always in tragedy. Red Sox fans, they're always expecting the worst. That's why I've always said that there are so many psychiatrists in New England um, who have to cater to these poor Red Sox fans. They're almost always in the pennant race. They're always up there. The Red Sox have moved on to the American League Championship Series. When the Red Sox get into those situations, you're almost waiting to see how they're going to blow it. So the question is, whose curse is worse? Better yet, which team's fans suffer more because of it? There is a market difference between the Red Sox fans and the Cubs fans. The average Cub experience is as follows. You go to the ballpark, you have a couple of beers before the game, you have a couple of beers during the game. If the Cubs don't win, well, that's our Cubbies. Oh no, that's not the way it is here. When that ball went through Bill Buckner's legs, hundreds of thousands of people felt he had done it to aggravate them personally. They took it personally. Sam Sianis' goat is their weak attempt to latch on to the Red Sox story. Those of us who are Cub fans have absolutely zero sympathy for Red Sox fans who claim they're cursed. Cursed my butt. They've been in three World Series in my lifetime. Cubbies have never been there. They want to talk about Buckner? Try Leon Durham. We'd give anything to reach a World Series, let alone a seventh game of a World Series. Their pain is nothing. Nothing compared to being a Cubs fan. The 2003 League Championship Series was really unbelievable. There was a great game on every night. Yankees, Red Sox, Red Sox, Yankees. Cubs and Marlins, back and forth. That may sound demented, given our history, but you got the feeling that maybe, just maybe, this is gonna be our year. Who would have thought it when this season began? These would be the teams playing with a trip to the World Series on the line. One of the fiercest rivalries in all of sports, Boston and New York. That's what makes this series awesome. You got two heavyweight fighters. This is almost like this is this is almost like the World Series, really. But the potent Red Sox offense came out swinging like we were used to seeing during the regular season. The Red Sox have taken Game One. Here come the Cubs. It's a very still night, kind of a muggy night, and the ball is flying. Game one, ninth inning. Oh, God! I don't believe it! Sammy Sosa ties the game! But two innings later, euphoria turned into despair. Well, this is pretty well hit. Lofted at the wall. Out of here! Mike Lowe comes off the bench! He's a hero tonight in the 11th. The Yankees, meanwhile, won game two. And back in Chicago, Sammy was slugging the fans into a state of delirium. High drive, straight away center. Sammy plays long ball. And I mean long ball. Cubs win. To the Cubs win their first league championship series game since 1989. In Florida, Dusty Baker had a premonition about Doug Glanville. I mean, that was very exciting because uh, before the game, I told somebody that Doug was going to win the game. One away, 11th inning. Line in the left center field, a base hit. Crofton's going to score. Cubs lead 5-4. Cubs win. In game four, a new hero. He puts a charge into this one, and Ramirez is not hit. I took the 3-1 lead, everything looked great. You know, I figured, okay, finish him off down in Miami, we'll get a little rest before we have to face off against the Red Sox-Yankees winner, and we'll go from there. Half for the short. Cup fans have waited 58 years to get to the World Series. They will wait 48 more hours to have a chance again. And they lost the game down there, and well, that's going to happen. They're still up three games to two. Pryor will win the thing, and Wood will start the World Series, and everything will be great. Sox-Yankees, game three, Rocket against Pedro with everything on the line. Pedro versus Lemons, Red Sox, game, no Sox. 
And we got Roger and Martinez, game three, split, championship series, American League, all eyes are on the Sox. You've got to be going with the Sox. You've got to be going with the Sox. This is a Sox race, 2003, and screw that curve. We were all out for blood. We would have loved to see Pedro shut the Yankees down, the Red Sox sweep them right there in Boston. But to get blood, you've got to open wounds. Wow, is this ugly. And when all was said and done, the Red Sox had been beaten by their past. They have beaten Pedro with Roger Clemens, and they lead this series two games to one. They have to be stunned here in Fenway. You know, I'd love to see the Red Sox win the World Series. You know that. It's in your heart, too, but not this one. <laughs> not this one. Yeah, not this year. And it didn't look like it would be Boston yet when the team split the next two games, putting the Yankees up three games to two. But back in the Bronx, a place where Boston dreams quite often go to die, the vaunted Red Sox offense exploded early and off. Nixon hammers one to deep right. This ball is in the upper deck, a two-run home run. We'll see you tomorrow night. Game seven. We knew we were going to get to game seven. This is what it's about. It's a storybook. Clemens and Pedro Martinez, the curse will be on the line. Well, the stars seem to be aligned for the Chicago Cubs. They have Mark Pryor getting the ball tonight, their best pitcher. But we are talking about the Chicago Cubs. For both the Cubs and the Red Sox, it seemed as if the demons of the past would finally be lifted. The Red Sox strike first. Lofton comes in to score. Cubs lead one to nothing. The Red Sox doing everything right so far tonight. Here comes Sosa. He scores. And that is it for Roger Clemens. He is knocked out here in the fourth inning. Mark Pryor has pitched brilliant so far. Pedro Martinez has been outstanding. And the Cubs fans can smell it now. Ortiz gets into one to right. It's 5-2. If the Yankees somehow do come from behind, then there must be something to this curse business. The Marlins beginning to run out of outs against Mark Pryor. They're down to their final 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 five. Final five. It, was, it, was, it was super crazy. I mean, people were, uh, were high anxiety, full of anticipation, you know, when they were going to finally go to the World Series. I mean, everybody was. You've got Pedro on the mound. You've got a big lead. You're late in the ball game. It's over. How many times have you heard that phrase? Wait till next year. Has next year finally arrived? In that 2003 ALCS, you just couldn't help but thinking, we're going to the World Series. In the 2003 NLCS, you couldn't help but think we were going to the series. I mean, come on. We were just five outs away. Just to be clear, five outs away. We were just five outs away. Five outs away. Into the air, got a left field line. Oh, yeah. Reaching into the stands and couldn't get it. He's living with a fan. That was a catchable ball. so upset because I knew I had it 100%. I had a great jump. I timed the ball real well, and I had it in my glove until the fan interfered with me. If you're a Cub fan, you don't think Bartman lost the game three. That's not what happened. But if you're a Cub fan, there's always a Bartman moment where it starts to come apart. And when that ball fell, you knew it. To tell you the truth, the feeling that I had after that happened was like, what's going to happen now? Ground ball towards short. Gonzalez has it, bobbles it, and everybody is safe. A huge mistake by Alex Gonzalez. That was surreal that happened because, you know, he makes that play two out ten times. And the fans are in shock at Wrigley. The Marlins have tied it up here in the eighth inning. When that snowball started rolling down that hill, you know, in the eighth inning, and it, it just kind of like took everybody's breath away. It's an eight to three game. A nightmare of an eighth inning. It absolutely blindsides you, and it, it just hits you with stunning quickness.
we were so close. You can't believe it. We're that close. And then this weird incident happens, and then all the dominoes fall. Eight runs. No explanation. It was easy to blame Bartman in Chicago, but he didn't give up those next four hits. <laughs> Three walks. Eight runs, and he didn't make that error. And it's safe to say that every Cub fan has to be wondering right now, is the curse of the Billy Goat alive and well? Game seven of the ALCS, Boston was just five outs away from snuffing out that Yankees mystique. We had a feeling in the, in the dugout we could stay close to Pedro. We would, you know, come back and beat him. Line to center field, face it. Cheater rounds third. He'll score, and the Red Sox have a 5-3 lead. Back-to-back -back hits. Bring the Yankees to within two. Brady Little comes out. When Grady came up, the simple question was whether I could pitch to Matsui or not. And I said yes. With 115 pitches on the night, Brady Little is going to stick with his starter. When he's your best pitcher and he tells you, Skipper, I've got enough left in my tank, you're not going to take him out. Tying run at the plate for New York, it's Hideki Matsui. Line like a bullet, it's a base hit, it's a grounds rule double, and the Yankees are a single away from tying the game. This is the most blatant situation for a second guest in this series. It was easy to blame Grady in Boston. Hell, it cost a man his job. But you suppose he pulled Pedro, and the next pitcher gave up four straight hits and three runs. Ah, what difference whose fault it was. It still sucks. The Yankees are a single away from tying the game. A blue shadow center, falling, falling, base hit! comebacks you'll ever see. Game seven was still tied, but you couldn't fault the Red Sox fans for having a feeling of impending doom. In Chicago, Cubs fans felt the same way, even though it was their series that was tied. But the Cubbies did offer one last glimmer of hope that this might indeed be the year. Swung on, hit the air to deep left. It's got a chance. Gary Wood Homer was the closest thing that we got to the excitement that we felt in Game 6. There was a brief moment that this could be it. Moise Salou launching one to Waveland Avenue. Cubs lead 5-3. You know, I thought we were in pretty good shape. We were back in the game, we went ahead, bam, and, uh, and then they came back again. The Marlins have recaptured the lead at 6-5. These Marlins are something. All real Cub fans knew it was over. That this was part of what being a Cub fan is all about. Just sitting there and watching it, watching it all just ebb away, it was a terrible moment to be a Cub fan. The Florida Marlins are going to the World Series. It's such a sad way to end the season. The frustration and the disappointment in this ballpark and in this city, in this city, in this city. Back in the Bronx, the game drifted into extra innings and an extra day. It was pure torture for what we all knew was coming. Finally arrived. My husband went to bed. He just couldn't bear it. He, he wouldn't even watch it. We go to the bottom of the 11th. Here's Aaron Boone to lead off. There's a fly ball. Keep the left. It's on its way. There it goes. And the Yankees are going to the World Series. Aaron Boone has hit a home run. A most unlikely finish against their century-old rivals, the Red Sox. For the fans in New England, more heartbreak. Watching that home run, I remember just turning the television set off, complete silence, five outs away. It was right there for us. Maybe there is a curse. He's smiling. He's smiling. There is a curse. A curse. If you can explain it to me, then let me know, because I cannot explain it. It was five outs away from the unbelievable. Generations of families were five outs away. Every time the Cubs have a good year, the curse comes up. 
The players say, we don't want to hear about history. That has nothing to do with us. And the fans say, but we were here. And you're wearing the uniform. And after a while, the players kind of begin to understand. Obviously, everything gets magnified in the playoffs. And then when you throw the Red Sox and the Cubs in there, everything's magnified because any little thing that, say, is out of the ordinary, they're going to point to that and say, you know, that might have been the, the one thing that caused them to lose the game. It is weird to me that certain things happen that uh, don't seem logical. Yeah, you have to believe we're getting some help from somewhere. We were that close to doing it, and that was the frustrating thing, is that we were that close to being that team, taking this city and this tradition to the next level. You gotta wait on when it comes. You can't force it. And uh, unfortunately for us, uh, it never came. Until some team comes along and takes them to a world championship, every team is going to become part of that curse that they pretend in the beginning doesn't exist. We finally were all given a chance to take a deep breath. The playoffs have been more than anybody could have asked, at least anyone that doesn't live in Boston or Chicago. People didn't want to go to work. Boston was like in a little capsule. We couldn't talk about anything but that. It's cataclysmic. It is the worst loss in Red Sox history. The Red Sox should have been in the World Series, except the curse came back and bit them. Cowboy up, partner. Cowboy out, according to those people. Didn't watch any of the World Series, didn't really care. I didn't watch the World Series at all. Uh, I think I walked past the TV once. I'm taking nothing away from the Marlins, because I know how tough it is to do what they did. But it's like, it's as close as it gets last year, and they've missed it. You know, that's hard. You really have to be a Red Sox fan to understand how it felt at the end of the 2003 League Championship Series. To be so close, and once again, to come up short. But there is no remedy greater than spring training. And this year, the fans have been coming out in record numbers. More fans here than most, most games. They're just here for practice. This is unbelievable. No more. Look around, it's a phenomenal scene. I mean, fans everywhere, they flock down from the Northeast. They're just as excited as we are to get out here on the field. You better get ready. We don't intend to second today. I think that people love an underdog. It makes them want to push the team up. Fans are glad that baseball's back. Uh, the players are glad to be back. If I do hit it, it'll be over there. <laughs> oh, no, I, I got no chance. Everyone's optimistic that this could be their year. No team more so than the Cubs, thanks in great part to their exciting off-season acquisition. We added some very, very outstanding men, um, character-wise and, and baseball-wise. Greg Maddox, man, big-time winner. This guy's been in the playoffs every year the last dozen years. No! You're going to get traded. No better place to come than Chicago. Derek Lee, I mean, he's a guy from the team that beat us to go to the World Series to win. Todd Walker, boss of Red Sox. Having switched from the Red Sox to the Cubs, I'm a big believer in the Red Sox curse, but not necessarily the Cubs curse. I don't think any curse is going to stop us this year. Man, this is what makes us better, though, because we face prior our own teammates. Get ready for those other guys. Boston's camp was also feeling good because the Red Sox management had stepped up. Get in, Monster! The good core guys that we had such great chemistry last year and kept it together and, and, and made some good additions. We definitely have some great additions. And, you know, you got Schilling, you got Folk. These guys are just tremendous. Our problems last year was pitching and closing. And your thought as far as being a Red Sox fan has to be, oh, my Lord, look what we've done. How many games you won the last three years? No, wait, how many games you won the last three years? <laughs> Top to bottom, this is as good a staff as I've ever been on. Yeah. Sorry, you've only won 50-some games last three years. You're bad. Around at this roster, and I see a team that, if we stay healthy, we could be world champions. It's just going to be up to us. Well, not exactly. You see, while the Red Sox were showing up their pitching staff, their longtime nemesis was sticking it to them. Big time. The evil empire yeah. strikes once again. You know, Boston and New York is always going to be a very heated rivalry. 
and I think uh, I come in and I throw a little log in the fire. You can't even begin to know the ramifications of this deal for the Red Sox. Ladies and gentlemen, number 13, Alex Rodriguez of the New York Yankees. This is clearly a victory for the Yankees, getting a player that was literally within hours of becoming a member of the Red Sox nation. Talk about things that happen so quickly. Aaron Boone is our third baseman. Then he has this unfortunate accident playing basketball and hurts himself. Aaron Boone. Some people are calling it the biggest deal since the Yankees got Babe Ruth from the Boston Red Sox. You know, they're going to point to the curse of the Bambino. My job is to, and my teammates' job is to hopefully keep that curse alive. As far as the curse, it's something that you hear, but I don't believe in it. I mean, you got to win baseball games. It's just about putting a good team together, going to camp, and having a great season. With A-Rod, without A-Rod, this is the best Red Sox team that I've seen since being a Red Sox fan. That series a bust. <laughs> yeah, I know. This year, this better be the year. I'm hoping. I don't know what Cubs fans think. They think they're going to win this year. Absolutely. But this year, they do have the players. <laughs> We're looking forward to winning this year. There's not, not a chance in hell they're going to lose. Who knows? Maybe this will be the year that the Cubs and the Red Sox face off in the World Series. That way, at least someone's guaranteed to finally reverse the curse and win it all. Although, can you imagine being the loser of that series? A lot of people would like to see those two teams meet. Armageddon would arrive. Yeah, the end of the world. There's a lot of motivation in that as a player for the Red Sox or the Cubs. An opportunity to win a World Series in either city would be an incredible thing for us as players because we know we would accomplish something that hasn't been accomplished in our lifetime and, and probably even our father's lifetime. I'm excited about 204 because uh, I think they're both solid ball clubs. So just give us another year like you gave us last year, regardless of all the hex and the, the, both the goat and the bambino, they're going to do it. Yeah.